the right position is of course king b7 and then b4 rook take b4 c4 rook take c4 d4 rook take d4 and then and then g, uh, f4 and you win the position but this is a very good way you know you let them play a new mini game and then you put up a little bit of a, a test to this game cross the board for example let's say that you, you give them this then you can say okay now I give you a little chess problem from this let's say that white plays e4 like this uh, let's say that black plays um, uh, d6 uh, let's play f4 let's see let's play and I'm just and I, I need to think a bit just to see like this no. e4 e6 e4 d5 like this for example white plays e5 and in this position let's say that black plays f6 and you say what do you think is the best move for white in this in this position yeah it's correct huh? because the, how do you win this game you want to reach the other side how can you make a clear route for your pawns to go um, and they find maybe after being thinking this little move you know i know but the thing is if you introduce it like this it's a chance because it's much simpler than in normal chess because it's only one. How can you make a clear route for this pawn? You know, I, I do. I, I know that this is difficult, but you can have this kind of exercises to also these simpler games because normally you only have classical chess exercises. But also to these kind of mini games, you can give them these kind of exercises or these kind of exercises so they train to develop uh, this ability to. To, to solve uh, problems. Okay, now we go into my favorite game of all. It's progressive chess. This is, I would say, my, uh, uh, you know, when the children are a little bit better, but I think this is probably the best exercise for chess training at all. With also, I play it a lot with uh, the national team of Sweden or with the Norway and so on. And uh, in this position, it's white who starts and plays, for example, e, uh, one move, e4. Now it blacks to play, and black will play two moves in a row. Then black plays three moves in a row. Two moves. Then uh, white plays four moves. Uh, the, one move for white, two moves for black, then three moves for white, four moves for black, five moves for white. It always you add in one move. Do you understand? But, but this means, but this means, but very soon you need to look for checkmate. You understand? We might start with two mo one move, black makes two moves. Now it's white to play. And white can play like this and this and for example like this. And now it black to move. What would you say? Black has got four moves. What is the best way for black to play in this position? Three moves. It's enough with three moves, but it's correct. But what should black play? Of course, like this, one, two, and three, and checkmate. And I can tell you, the scholar's mate is very dangerous in this game. Very, very dangerous. Most of the games will be checkmate. Yes. What happens when the yes. first move from the four yes. is checked? Exactly. As soon as it is checked, it is the opponent's turn to play. Do you understand? As soon as it's so, what you should do is the last move to make check in the last move. Okay. Also in this game, forget, don't forget about this with the scholar's mate. And also another thing, what is so good with this, what I like, do you remember this with dream position and the ideal sequence? This is exactly what you train. Where is the mating picture? What should it look like and how to reach this mating picture? That's why I think this is so good. So please try again. White with one move, black will make two moves in a row and so on. Checkmate, then it's game over di direct. If it's a checkmate, it's game over direct. If it's a check, only a check, then game continues. Okay? And uh, white has got five moves to play in this position. Now we will make a competition here. 
how many different checkmates can you find? So it's white to play, five moves in a row. How many different checkmates can you find? Magnus could find 12 different checkmates in this position. He was, he was only 11, but uh, we, we don't say that. But it's more, it's, the children love this when I say compete with Magnus, you know, they love this. And we'll see. So it's white to play. How many different checkmates can you find for white in this position? I give you six minutes and see how many checkmates you can find here. It can be checkmate. If it's queen is here, it's checkmate. How to do this? Of course, then you need to go up with a knight like this, the queen up here, checkmate. But first, you need to take away the knight. Huh? Uh, this is two moves, the queen and its checkmate. But of course, you can also do it like this, up with the bishop, one, two, knight up, queen up, and checkmate. That's two different checkmates, okay? But then there are no more checkmates for, for h7, because if you go with the knight, it's a check, okay? Then we have this here. Okay, so you can put up like, yes? Yes. Yes. No, because then it's check on f6. You're, you, that, that's why I said it, there, there are no more checkmates, huh? Okay, let's say like this. Now we go for this one. We want the queen to be here. But how can we support it? For example, one, two, and then you have this, this, and checkmate. You have this, this, checkmate. You have this, this, checkmate, of course, okay? So that's the one way. But then, of course, you have like this also. One, two, three, four, five. So there are a lot of different checkmates for this square. And the bishop is so so that's bishop h6. Bishop h6. You can have this yeah. one. You can have this, 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 this. Or the go or here, take this and this one. So there is many. Or you bishop can go like this, this, yes. this. Take here. It's checkmate. So there are a lot of checkmates. But then you have other Knight. very nice checkmate. Knight. You have this in four moves. You have this. Knight. Take here, like this. Knight. King is guarded, and here, and here, here, and it's only four moves. I say to the children, this is golden yeah, so star. So it's knight e5, and it's the same. And it's the same. That's no, no difference. Then you have another beautiful one. It's this one. And then you can do one, yes, two, three, and it can be a rook, or it can be a, a queen. Okay, that's one. Uh, or two, that is two more. You have another one. You can go here. Take here, take here, you have this and this, and it's a checkmate again. Then you have again, you have like this one, you have uh, this, take here, go here, go here, no, sorry, so here, go here, and there is a checkmate again. There are so many different possibilities in this one. And for me, you know that if you're a good chess player, to be creative in the attack, it's very important to have all these ideas inside your head. And that's why I think this exercise is so nice. What I usually do is I let the children play, and when you see a position where there can be a checkmate in three, four, five moves, I stop all the games and say, pick up this position, put it on the chessboard, and I say, can you find the way to checkmate? You can have it like a competition. Now, I think you two should be go and make a test with Stanislav. You will have half an hour, he will give you the instructions. <laughs> so that's it, okay. So this is progressive chess, and I think this is a fantastic tool. I have used it a lot in Sweden and in Norway for all the grandmasters and so on, the children I've trained. I think it's a brilliant way to develop your skills in attacking. Okay, that's it. Now let's move on to the next part. Now I want you to have an empty chess set as well. I, just, I can show you how to do it. I think this is a very great exercise as well. So if you have an empty chess board, you have an empty chess board, we can, I can show you on this, they can, you can illustrate what I mean. Now, we put this in between here, and you can put your pieces however you like. 
on your side, you put it on your side, I take it away, and white starts a normal game of chess. Okay? Yes. But the pawn must be? The pawn must be on the second row and forward, but otherwise you can put them as you like. Fisher chess. No, it's not Fisher chess. No, whatever you like on these like like four squares. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the pawns uh, cannot be on the first row, but on this. Only in everywhere. everywhere. Only in everywhere. everywhere. That's right. So you can try it out. And my question is, what is the best setup for your pieces? <laughs> what is important when you play chess? First of all, let's say that it's very important to have a safe king. Okay? How do you make a safe king? Of course, you should have a lot of pawns like this, in front of the king like this, for example. There you have, it's very, very difficult to give checkmate to a king that has got this position. And one very good thing is here, that you have this square, because then it will not be made on the first row. So that can also be a good thing. Then, how do you make these pieces great? For example, it could be good to have the rooks like this, it will be very strong if they are like this. Why not have bishops, you know, and the queen like this? It will be very strong if there is something yeah. here. Then you could have like a bishop maybe here, something like that, or here maybe, but let's say here. The knights are normally good in the center, could be here or here. And in this, this could be like a very good setup. You have the rooks and the queens on the open row, you have the bishops open, the knights in the center, and you have a safe king. So that, I, that is the way I present it. This is a good way to start a discussion what makes a good position? How can you make every uh, piece come to life and make them as good as possible? And if they play this game first, like you played your game, I don't think your setup was the best one, <laughs> I must say. I think they will understand why this is such a better, much better position. Not the least if it's white to that starts this game. So I really like this, to have a mini game so they play themselves. But then you take the opportunity to give them also a lesson what is important to think about, to deepen up the understanding of chess with an exercise, with some way to, to show them how you can learn chess from this type of mini games. Okay, now let's sit down and we continue. We always start with long every break notation. I mean, where is the piece standing? Where does it go to? I write down both. And then next step, you give them the short notation. Yes. Does every one of you, do every one of you know short notation? Yes, that's good. Because then I move on. Scholars made, for example, fully notated like this. And then you have, uh, this is uh, the short algebraic notation. It's like uh, long versus short, you can see here. This is a short one, you only write down where it comes to the piece and the other one is where also where it comes from. This is the difference. Again, if ch uh, teachers are very new to chess, this is something to understand. And the reason is, of course, that if you know short uh, algebraic uh, notation, then you have all the chess literature you can dig, dig deeper into. So it's very good to teach uh, how it works as well. Okay, now I want us to work in groups again. There are several topics I would like us to discuss. First of all, how should you deal with disputes? Which are the most common disputes that you have in your groups? How do you do with this touch move rule? If children say, I touched it, no I didn't, and this kind of stuff, how to solve this kind of situations? And of course, the remedy for an illegal position or a move. How do you solve this when this occurs? Dispute. What? Dispute. Dispute is when they argue. When the children said, I didn't do that, yes you did, no I didn't, yes you did, and so on. What kind of this? In 30 seconds, I will come back. You will choose this side or this side, and then I solve the problem like this. If you cannot solve it yourself before, 
I will come and we see what the coin will tell you. And this is the coin of truth. And he said that children nearly always solve the problem themselves because they don't want to see the coin of truth. Okay? I don't know if they, actually, I think this is quite okay. You can try it out, but I like this trick because it makes the children think, okay, I don't want to have this coin of truth. We better solve this, how to do this, and then normally they do. Okay, let's move on. Now, I want you to do something a little bit more important. I will give you 10 minutes to discuss what is important to think about when you plan a term. Let's say now it's soon, uh, autumn will start, the whole term will start. What is important for you to think about when you plan this term? Let's say we have only seven minutes to go, I think, for this exercise. So you work in your groups. Now I want one in the group to take notes. One in the group to take notes. What is important? And what I want you to do now is to use the SMART method. Use this for the planning of the term. What is important to think about when it comes to self-learning, motivation, adjustment of level, range, technology? Please, I give you six, seven minutes to discuss how you plan the term in the best way. Okay. They start at the bottom of a wall, like this. And every lesson they earn points, and after the lesson they can put up the little rocket on the wall. In the end of the term, some of the rockets will be up in the sky, you know, climbing in the roof, and the children love that a lot. What is the danger with this type of point race? Yes. So very, very important is to make it as equal as possible. And the difficulty is, just like we discussed yesterday, is what to do with the weaker ones. What I do is that with this point system, I am the judge. I give the points. And then I can give some extra points for the weaker kids. I think this point race is a bit dangerous because of this, just like you say, because normally it's the good children, they like this, they love this point race because they are good, they will win. The weakest ones, they will stop playing chess. So if you use this system, I don't say it's bad, but if you use it, you need to think about how to give points to the weakest ones. It could be, oh, that was a good move, I give you an extra point today. It could, you, these kind of tricks, you really need them to get the group together. So it's not like someone is up here, someone is down there. They need to be gathered in a way to make this use. Okay, I know the routine and so on. Then you need to do something else. I call it, they need a carrot. You don't need something extra. So maybe I plan for a completely new tournament, something completely different. Maybe this exercise, a group exercise, we go out and do something. So they be surprised fourth or fifth time. Then of course you need to think about what curriculum you should use, should you have an incentive scheme, uh, what kind of tournaments you should use. And then one thing that I always think about. In the beginning of a term you need to have a good kickoff so they get really interested. How can you make a good kickoff so they get interested? I always think about that. Just as well I need, you always need a very good ending. So, for example, I always have a Christmas party in the end of my terms, on if it's in Christmas, and then in the end of the summer term, a really nice ending, because you want the children to come back after summer to chess, then if you have a good ending, they will come back. So this is something I think about. What I also always do is to check where are the tournaments. Yes, Maybe so if the children, if you check the calendar, is there a school tournament you wanted to participate in? Then maybe the lesson before could be planning for this tournament. Or you could have like this, like a motivator for the children. In the end of each term, I normally also have it like this. If it's small children at school, I usually invite the parents to come. 
and we have a match between the children and the parents. The children normally like that, to, have a, to beat their parents. They love this, to beat, beat the parents. You know this, as parents you know. Then of course if you think about this, how do you maintain the interest? Well, chess competition during the year, someone said, how do you plan for these kind of tournaments? What you could do is also you could have a school chess day. I normally do that uh, at some schools. We have like, for the whole day, there is like a school day. This is about the turf. Is there anything, questions on this, on the planning of the turf? Because I think this is the key. Another thing that I always do is that I normally do a printed schedule. It don't have to be in detail, just a little bit, also to give to the parents with your telephone number and so on. So if they have questions, they can call you, they can see the development that they do. It gives a professional impression and it makes it more likely that the children will be impressed and want to do things. Okay, now I want to discuss finally, uh, for five minutes only, when you now you have made your term planning, it's time for the lesson planning. What is important to think of when you plan for your chess lesson? What is good content? Do you understand? The difference is, first you plan for the whole term, now you plan for a specific lesson. What is important then? Important. You know, how can you make it fun for the children so they want to play chess? Then of course, I want to develop them socially and intellectually. This is the goal when I work in chess in schools. But the last thing that I do is that I try to stimulate the child to play outside school. Because every one of you know that the magic moment with a child is that when they find chess is so funny that they want to do it outside. All good chess players have had moments when they train at home, when they go, you know, every time, when I was from 10 years old, I came home from school, I immediately took my chess board and started to look at books and so on, because I thought it was so funny. And you can do like, why not have like a competition? How many of your relatives in your family can you play with to next week? You can do these kind of tricks, or how many books do you think there is in the library of your town? How many chess books? You know, to encourage them. Or do you know you can follow, like, the European Youth Championship online? You know, in real time, you can follow it, you know, and they went in to this uh, uh, web page and they start to look for it and so on. Then, of course, when you plan a lesson, and you write quite a lot of what you said, clear start and clear ending. We have this table, I call it the game-free area. Sometimes I call it the round table. It could also be like that, but it's, it's the game-free area. We have the weekly anecdote. Do you know what that is? I, I start every lesson with a prepared little story because I want the children to be encouraged to love chess. For example, I, in the game free area, I usually start with a story about, do you know about Napoleon? Have you heard about him? He was a chess player. And you know why he was so good uh, uh, on the battlefield? Because he knew how to structure his army in the way of chess pieces. He even stood on a hill beside the battlefield, he had grouped his army in pieces like, and he could, with a flag system, who could make yeah, them like, ch like chess pieces like this, to move like chess pieces. It was only when the Englishmen made the same strategy that they could beat him. Otherwise, he would have been unbeatable because he was a chess player. This kind of small, you know, or maybe the story about the playing Turk, for example, or something like that, that could encourage them to play chess. Then I normally have a problem of the week, I prepare something like that. At least 50% is playing time, and of course the younger the children are, the more they need to play. Lesson tips. This is something I think is very important. If you show to the children that this is important, if you prepare very well, they feel that you think this is important, they will think this is important. So be ready in time. Use curriculum and lesson plans. Save all your lessons. I think that's also a very important trick. 
because I have, for example, myself, I have about 350 lessons prepared that I have done on these 20 years I've worked with this. And if someone calls me and say, can you give me a lesson on this topic or that, I can use my old lessons. This is a very good one. The children will find fun what you think is fun. You know, so what, if you find something that amuses you, you will show this to the children that this is funny. One thing I think we spoke about yesterday is that you should speak so the children will understand. You, if they are young children, you must use a language so they will understand. And these metaphors we have had, like you have a guard, build a fence, a barrier, very good way of working with kids because they will understand in another way. Then, one trick, always have some extra exercises ready because then you can have something in your sleeve if it's you feel they are very tired, you have a good exercise, a mini game or something like that. If they are really hooked on it, maybe you can go more deeper into it. This is also something I think is important. 